Hello and welcome to a royal edition of the UK edition. We'll find our way to Buckingham Palace this weekend on an invitation from Her Majesty the Queen. Well, not quite, but we will accompany three young Indians, remarkable Indians, who were invited to the palace by the Queen. Just what did they do to earn that invitation? More than most, for sure. Buckingham Palace opened its gates and its doors to three remarkable Indians for a meeting with none other than Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen honoured them and awarded them for their achievements that were quite remarkable, as we shall see. That recognition for their work was memorable for the winners and a boost to their work and a joy like no other. Aditya, you're looking very happy. You've just met Her Majesty. What was the meeting like? Okay, it was a very a pleasure moment for me. Uh, and. Uh, she did ask what I do, so I said I help pregnant women from villages to get access to healthcare services. And she says, I read about your project. Right, so that told you that she is very interested in what you do and she's not just giving away these prizes just as a sort of a ceremony. She is genuinely interested. You are absolutely right. She was curious enough to ask and even let me know that she knows my project. Right, and what will this meeting mean for you? Will this encourage you to do more? Yes, definitely. I hope this recognition will definitely help me, my team, to boost their confidence and work more effectively henceforth. Dian, so you've just met Her Majesty the Queen, which is a lot more than the rest of us have done. What was the meeting like? It was absolutely wonderful. You know, she looked me straight in the eye and asked me what I do. And when I told her about the work I do with menstrual hygiene, she said, you know, that's really important, Dian, and we need more people like you. It was very, very cool. <laughs> Right. And how long was the meeting? So, um, the meeting went on for about two, three minutes and we spoke about the work I do, the places where I do it at, and how I'm working with people across the Commonwealth now, the friends we've made over these past few weeks and how we're promoting menstrual hygiene across the Commonwealth and the world. And she was very interested in knowing more and more about what you do. Yes, so we got to meet her privately later as well and there we engage more in a discussion about what more we can do and how together when we work together how we can help create a world which is more period positive. And she was aware of the problem and of the extent of the problem and very mindful of the need to tackle it. Definitely, so when I first mentioned it she said, ah yes, I remember because we had spoken earlier the words and we spoke about how there's a need across the region, how we're moving not only from India, but to the rest of the world. It's a bit surreal. Can't feel my feet. It was... Yeah, your smile says it. <laughs> oh, it was absolutely surreal. Um, I think I almost underplayed it in my head, but the second you enter the palace, the opulence of the place just gets to you. And then when you meet her, the you know, I mean, um, just the interaction with her, she started off with asking what is the work that I do, which is always so, so appreciated when someone asks you, you know, what do you do? And I told her about the work briefly, that I work in the youth and gender rights space. And then she said, and where is this work that you do? And then we spoke about my work in advocacy for women to have guaranteed access to menstrual hygiene and sanitation. And she said, that's really quite lovely. And uh, yeah, the whole interaction was really lovely. And I'm so grateful to be here and to be recognized for the work that my team and I do. I must specify that my team, because they're a group of young 20 year olds who and, and, and she was very sort of um, humble and matter of fact and inquiring very respectfully what you do. She really was. It, I mean, uh, I could still be starstruck, but it did seem like she had a keen interest in, you know, she looks you in the eye. At that moment, she gives you all her attention and she leans in and she says, what do you do? And, you know, to always follow it up with another question to say, where is this work that you do? I think it just makes you, you know, in a little way, feel validated for the work that you do and feel recognized. Aditya Kulkarni is just 27 and he has developed an app with his group Care Mother to link pregnant women in need with health workers and expert medical care. The group has so far helped more than 30,000 women. Aditya, you went to IIT. You then got yourself an international degree in computer science. From that to looking after pregnant women in villages is an unlikely next step. What took you to it? Uh, Actually, it came from a personal experience. 
when my sister suffered from a pregnancy related complication and i was there to see her situation so after looking at that problem i realized if my sister after even getting proper medical service is facing problems what about mothers who are from villages who are not having access to healthcare so what did you then do then i started thinking about it and met lot of gynecologists as well as organizations who are working in this field where uh, i started in aurangabad uh, which was my uh, town and then slowly we worked with ngos in urban slums of mumbai uh, and saw that this is a real problem so you made contact with gynecologists on one hand and with people living in slums on the other right and you then tried to put them together how did you do that so my background is a technology background so i realized that technology can simplify this problem and what we need to do is connect these mothers to mainstream facilities through ground level touch points which are community health workers so that is the third pool you needed to access yes. the health workers yes where did you find them so we started working with organizations who already had that workforce and we enabled these people through technology in order to provide regular screening to the when you say technology what do you mean so we have developed a platform called care mother which is a antenatal care platform to do regular checkups during pregnancy and it is facilitated through these ground level health workers and service is provided at doorstep of a pregnant woman where she doesn't have access so you have a pool of health workers going out to meet pregnant women yes where is this so it happens in nine states right now we operate in different geographies different contexts even in northeast we have implementation in nagaland and we have 15 plus partner organizations who are working on this project till now we have covered almost 30000 pregnancies in india how many care workers do you have we have 350 care workers all over yes all these over. these these nine states right. and it is their job to be in touch with pregnant women they think may need particular care you are right uh, we also help these health workers to organize their work and know how personalized diagnostics can be provided to the end mother but you also developed an app to make all this possible yes how does that work so we register health workers on the app and health worker registers pregnant women and they on the app everything gets connected to the health facility which is where the specialists are yes you are right and these specialists will get notification about potential high risk mother would face in future at a very early stage so that they can design interventions at the right time and have a radical impact and the specialists provide online consultation specialists are there 24 by 7 however we just need to notify them whenever there is a complication but they provide support online yes they provide they do and what if someone needs support physically the health workers arrange that health workers are trained to have certain quick uh, interventions so what they would do is after consulting gynecologists they will book an appointment for the mother and assist mother to get to the facility so that gynecologist can uh, see her and how do these health workers get trained or equipped so health workers are already working in this maternal care space since a long time what we just do is train them with our app and technology and then they go out in the community to provide the service well there's a lot already 30000 women helped what next so uh, in 2015 when we met prime minister of india mr narendra modi we had given him a, a, a solid number which was 3 million pregnancies in next 5 years and this is what we need to achieve in india well that's a big step up how do you propose to get there uh, we are planning to work in ppp model with governments so already we have been in touch with three state governments to run a small scale pilot what we eventually want is to get exit from government where government would take over the project and see the sustainability aspects and our technology um, would be there to to help them out you've gone beyond india as well yes we have been working in kenya and bangladesh what led to that uh, we had international exposure through different global agencies like grand challenges canada google and these agencies partnered us with local uh, ngos in in this bangladesh and, and kenya where we started small scale implementation well and from that to a meeting with the queen is an interesting well let's not say next step but an interesting side step yes uh, this program would give us the visibility and recognition which we actually need um, we want to appeal to the people that we are really doing good work and through this recognition we believe it would be a little bit easier for us to engage with governments and other stakeholders in my country so recognition from the queen would help your work yes definitely in india and outside yes great work aditya keep going thank you very much thank you sanjay
Diane de Menezes is all of 24. She remembered the discomfort around her first menstrual cycle and built on that experience to make it easier for others. Diane, menstruation has so long been unmentionable, but there is a certain sprouting of awareness. We've had the film, we've had so many activities, so many activists coming to the fore now. Is that what led you to spread awareness around this? So, actually I began my journey two years back when I found myself in a bathroom where I just got my period and I had nothing around me. I did not know who to ask for a pad. And that just got me thinking, you know, what about the women and girls out there who do not have access to it? I fortunately could, but there were so many of my fellow countrymen without any access. So that's what got me to begin my journey and learn about a subject I did not know much about myself. And the journey means what? So when I did start, I did a lot of research about menstruation and I did not find too many organizations about it and there were pretty alarming statistics. So I decided to, you know, go out and start spreading awareness. But when I went to a lot of schools and organizations, I was faced with a lot of negative... You went on your own? I went on my own bright-eyed and I said okay you know let's do something about menstruation I spoke to a few organizations and I faced a lot of resistance because no one wanted to touch the topic then everyone said why don't you pick something easier this was in Mumbai this was in Mumbai you just went to schools and said listen I want to talk about menstruation yes. you went to the principal and this is what you said and what did they say and they said no we do not want to discuss this I don't think this is necessary. We don't want to talk about such a topic. And what did you do next? And that really startled me because I realized that more and more of many, many of my friends, many colleagues were not open and not okay with talking about it. But I was very determined to do something. So the first organization we actually worked with was a convent, a girls' school. And they had a problem of disposal of menstrual waste because girls were dropping out of school because they did not have access to affordable products and menstrual waste was a big problem. So you did go to this school and they did allow you a role? They did allow me. So they said, okay, we think this is important. We think this is necessary. We'll give you one shot. So I had a team and all of us went there. And when we did that first awareness session, we could see the difference within few minutes of beginning we were faced with awkward silences giggles whispers because everyone thought who are these people why are they talking about this topic which should never be spoken about but as we prodded and as we pushed and we got women to girls to speak about it we realized every woman and every girl had a story about it and how did you take that forward we understand you've taken that as far as vending machines and uh, disposal systems Correct. So we realized that when you want to do something, you do it well. I realized that giving access and giving awareness sessions about menstruation is not just enough. You help create access to affordable products. So we found vending machine um, creators and manufacturers who had... You found someone to design a vending machine for this? No. So surprisingly enough, we have these machines in place. There have been vending, sanitary napkin vending machines, but it's just not accessible. No one knows about these technologies. Where are these? In Mumbai? In Mumbai. So How many are there? We have installed about 20 so far. You've installed 20? Yeah, we've installed 20, thanks to a lot of generous funding. Who designed them in the first place? So Hindustan Life Care, if you would know this company, Hindustan Life Care, they designed a vending machine and there are a lot of other unorganized players also who have them. So for 10 rupees, you get three sanitary pads. So we installed it in the first um, school and within 10 minutes, the entire machine was um, empty. Everyone took them. And now there are 20 of them. No, there are 20. Where are they? All across the city and in some rural areas as well. But not only this, we realized that creating awareness about menstrual waste is important. Menstrual waste, uh, when um, a pad consists of plastics, there are a lot of chemicals, bleaches, and when not disposed correctly, animals end up eating it. They end up in landfills. When they are flushed in toilets, they expand because of the polymers inside it. So that is harming our environment as well. Which brings me to the name of our project. It's called Red is the New Green. Where we talk about something like menstruation, which is viewed so negatively. And also where we look at the most sustainable angle of it. Which moved on to the fourth part of our project, where we discuss sustainable menstruation. So you have now two streams going primarily. One is provision of 
these sanitary towels. The other is disposal of used ones. Correct. And how are you planning to scale this up? So what we plan to do is that we don't want to keep this project to ourselves. I see that across the country and globally, people taking this initiative forward on their own. We want to make it easy for others to do this. So that's how I plan to scale it, where we empower more change makers, more girls and boys to come forward, decide to do this in their colleges, schools, organizations. So together we create a more period positive planet. And how do you plan to fund all this? So right now uh, we've been you know, quite lucky with getting some corporate funding or individual donors, but we are looking to scale up, get more donations from outside to move forward. And that's a very fascinating story to tell the Queen. I know. I would like to know her experience, you know, because as a woman, that's something they can. everyone relates to. So with menstruation, whether you're rich or poor, whether your skin color is different, whatever your socioeconomic background may be, you are still going to bleed every month. And that I feel is such a unifying thing for women and people from other genders across this planet. And would you ask the Queen her experience with this? I would like to. <laughs> but I'd like to know what her views are about it and what she feels going forward. Because as women, that's a responsibility. Once we are empowered, we can empower more. Absolutely. Diane, you are a remarkably courageous girl. Thank you very much for talking to us and congratulations on this award. Thank you so well much for having us. Thank you so much. Trisha Shetty founded She Says, a group that supports women who face sexual abuse and violence. The group has developed resources to help women cope with these traumatic experiences and support them in finding a new way forward. Trisha, you know, you have the police, you have a number of uh, support groups. Where do you step in? You know, very often, unfortunately, we keep telling survivors, you know, speak up, speak up, be brave. But the second they do, you see the re-victimization that they face at every level. Then be it the police misdirecting them or refusing to file their F F F FIR information and filing an NC instead. So in a sense, are you saving them from the police themselves? No, we're not saving them. What we are trying to do is provide the right redressal for survivors of sexual abuse, as well as, unfortunately, sometimes victims, because we lose the victims and their families. So we've had Lose meaning? We've had a case where uh, a woman that we were helping ended up being set on fire and killed. And her family was questioned saying, you know, we found cigarette butts in your daughter's room. Does she smoke? By the police. So this is where we step in as an organization. And we try to really rehabilitate survivors and provide them access to quality health care as well as justice as best as we can. If that means coming with you to the police station and st standing next to you while you file your FIR. If that means coming with you to the hospital if you're a rape victim and making sure that the hospital provides you with the right kind of care. How do you identify these people? So multifaceted, one, we do have kind of a credibility name that's been established in India as an organization called She Says. So we have survivors reach out to us via social media very often. About how many? We have, on, I mean, on a roughly basis, we'd have at least one case that comes up to us per month. It then be it a sexual harassment at the workplace case, or be it in, you know, a you know, gruesome case of rape, or be it like sexual harassment on the street. Um, so we have people that reach out to us via social media. Sometimes the police stations that we work with, because not all police personnel are bad. We've also when you say we, how many are you? We're a group of about 20 people. All in Mumbai? No, we're pan-India, but our primary services that we provide to victims and survivors and their families on ground ends up being in Mumbai. But pan-India, we provide legal services. We also provide funding for any survivor who wants to seek counseling and therapy because we underestimate the social and the traumatic uh, impact that it has on survivors and how they need counseling to truly rehabilitate them back in society. So we want to make sure that we can, you know, we can tell survivors that the worst thing that has happened has already happened to you and how can we as an organization help you? Right. Now, we've just had a report saying that India is about the worst place in the world for women. What led you to get into this and what led you to become aware of the need for the work that you're doing? You know, as 
any woman or gender non-conforming person in India will tell you that they've had some or the other story of being sexually abused or know of someone who's been sexually abused. We're talking about a pandemic that's affecting 100% of the female population. And if that in itself is not alarming and gets people to say, what can we do as a society? What got you involved personally? Exactly this, looking around and saying that this is a bad situation. Every woman, every time we step out of our homes, we are accounting for who's going to touch us, who's going to stare at us, who's going to molest us. It's not like our homes are any safe at the workplace. So when you're looking at a number where, you know, 24 seven, you're looking over your shoulder, you're holding on to your clothes that much, you know, closer. And should something happen to you, then you have people ask you, but what were you wearing just before you got abused? You know, and what did you do just after you got abused? Like the obsession. Is there some sort of preventive work that you're also looking at? Yes. So one of the features that we're most proud of is we go to schools, colleges, impoverished communities, marginalized communities, and take gender sensitization seminars. So we talk to these children, adults, adolescents about consent, active, affirmative consent. What does consent look like in the legal terms? We also talk to them about the laws that they need to have access to. And once they know the laws, how can they report it? To really empower them with information. And another thing that we do is focus on bystander intervention. So if you something see something going wrong, how can you intervene without putting your personal safety at risk? And if a friend comes up to you, or a family member, or anyone comes up to you and says they've been sexually abused, how can you be a support system for them? What are you expecting the queen to recognize this work you do? No, I don't think I, I, I mean, I never started my work. I've been fortunate enough to be recognized by the Queen, by President Obama and by President Macron. And we never, we never really did the work to be recognized. We did the work more so, so that tomorrow, for me, I mean, this is wonderful. It's, it's surreal to go to the palace, receive an award. Something like that doesn't happen very often. But, uh, and I'm not trying to sound cheesy, but honestly, the most validating thing for every one member in my team is when a survivor reaches out to us after the abuse and says, I'm doing okay. So that's the work that we do. And I think when your work is rooted in on-ground uh, help for survivors, the accreditation and the recognition does follow. Congratulations on the award, Trisha, and we are all very respectful of the work you do. And of course, we all dream of a day when uh, this becomes unnecessary. That is very much true, but till then we have to keep working and I'm really glad to be able to represent India here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, of course, that the Queen should have recognized this work and invited them to the palace to honor them personally. Now, what could we do to get invited? Let's think and do. And in the meanwhile, we'll have a lot more to share with you that is remarkable here on CNN News 18.